welcome to the November 8th business meeting of the Charlotte City Council. Uh, my name is Julie Eiselt and I am presiding in place of our mayor this evening who had some personal family business to attend to. Um, I am going to go ahead and call this meeting to order and ask for, um, well, I guess we'll do introductions down in the, um, down in the chamber when we move down there at 6.30. So the first thing we're gonna do is have our city manager give us an agenda overview with our presentations for the three items on the agenda review for tonight. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So what we have on the agenda tonight are, are three items, a Centene project update, the proposed 2022 state and federal legislative agendas, and as we have been doing periodically, a Charlotte Future 2040 policy map update. And who, we actually have Marie Harris that's in the room now, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, to have any questions that are related to the consent items. I know that there have been a few questions that you've had earlier today, and I believe those are in front of uh, the council members. So Mayor Pro Tem, if it's fine to turn it over to Marie. Yes, thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you. And again, as he said, there's several questions in front of you um, that have been asked for this evening. And I know there's a few of note that you'll call for um, if you want anything pulled on a separate vote. But there's a few that Councilmember Winston would like as a separate vote. Mr. Winston, if that's still correct. Yes. And if you had any additional questions beyond these. Mr. Winston. Um, well, I have one uh, question um, or comment um, about item number 46. Um, it, was, it was ironic to see this. I actually spent some time this weekend um, with, with some community members that um, work uh, in uh, tree removal, um, but also in the fine arts. Uh, they turn their products, um, those trees that, that are fell or um, even trees that we fell, um, into um, products like furniture, art, um, and other things. So in, in, you know, in the same kind of fashion, and this is something that they were asking about actually, um, in the same kind of um, intersection, in, in, intersections of the priorities of this council and the city around um, circular economy, around arts um, investment, um, around um, 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 workforce development, um, I'm wondering um, if there is um, any way we can work with these arborists um, and perhaps in the future um, work with the staff um, um, to, to see if there's an opportunity here um, to do more with these resources that we have in the nature of, like for instance, <coughs> North Carolina is very well known for furniture manufacturing. I'm sure that has to do with our, 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 um, our, um, ca our canopy. Um, a lot of that has left, right, um, uh, th this region um, over time. Is there a way that we can foster in, in, in the same kind of modicum of, 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 of this region um, something else utilizing these resources, these nat in this case, these natural resources that we have, that we have to deal with? Is there just something better that we can do? So, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, to uh, Council Member Winston's question, Totally agree. The um, partnership or relationship that the city has with Envision Charlotte and um, what's happening over at the Innovation Barn, I believe there's opportunities not only for uh, this, but in terms of upcycling, um, keeping things uh, out of the, uh, the waste stream as a part of the initiative. So if the ask is, uh, are there some opportunities think about, for partners? Uh, arts, arts investment, um, yes. th things like that. Yes. So uh, I'll uh, uh, talk with Amy over at Division Charlotte, as well as have a conversation with Priya to see if there are some additional opportunities we could do in that area, in those areas. I'd I love to, um, you know, be abreast of that. And, you know, some of the community members, like I said, um, that I was in contact with this weekend, I think can bring some, some particular insights uh, into it. So it was very ironic to see that. So it's great. Thanks. Okay, there, um, and I should have mentioned that on the consent agenda items, staff has pulled items number 21, number 59 from the agenda, and 68, and 68 will be deferred to a, a future agenda. Um, do we have any other uh, items in the consent agenda items that people want to make a comment on or pull for a separate vote? 
just just the ones that I've already noted. Okay, thank you. Those are items that that would be forty one and forty. Will be pulled for a separate vote. Okay, and any other comments? Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to the manager for a Centene project update. So, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And so, what we'll start off with is we have uh, Tracy Dotson who will provide you with an update with the, where we are with uh, Centene and a uh, CIP a request that will come to you, I believe, later this month. Good evening, Council. Um, so hopefully with this one, you will see that this is a kind of good news story um, as we bring it. It is another Council um, action item later this month, as the manager said, but it really is intended to be um, something that highlights how we build partnerships. And, you know, part of the reason we've, I, well, part of the success, I think, when we do business recruitment now and for the city to run these projects is we build out partnerships that are sustaining and allow us to achieve additional community objectives. And this is an example of kind of that ongoing partnership with Centene. Do I have control of it? There we go. Okay. So before I get to this new partnership, let me, let me remind you where we started. We announced in July of 2020 the East Coast headquarter that was 3,200 jobs um, with an average salary of 100,000 and over a billion dollars of capital investment. Um, there are some things that just made Centene special on top of the number of jobs. They have on site daycare, they have um, a Centene University that they're planning as a part of this campus. And so we felt like that was a really good partner that we wanted in our community. But they also understood things like mobility, which we'll get to. Um, the campus is scheduled to open in the third quarter of next year. A lot of work has gone on. And I just wanna show you, this is kind of a couple of slides of how the construction has been going. I have to give a shout out um, to the city and the county, Nan Peterson, the land development team have done an incredible job in this partnership. The first time we met with the Centene CEO, his priority and the thing he needed from us was to stay on the construction schedule. As you can imagine, having a billion dollar uh, campus plan, not meeting those deadlines on construction just means we're delaying when we can have those jobs in place. So I want, to, I want to just further expand on how this partnership has been so successful. So this is something that I stole from Centene. They had used it with their board. And on the left, you have a picture from St. Louis and a project that started about the same time. And on the right, you will see Charlotte. So this is September of 2020. Here's the same project in March of 21. Again, St. Louis on the left, Charlotte on the, on the right. And um, not a single uh, construction schedule deadline has been missed so far. So I think it says a lot on a project like this. And then here we are in September of this, sh of this year. You can see St. Louis, they're barely getting out of the ground. And half of the main campus that Centene proposed is, is up. And so again, it's really a shout out to the partnership the city and the county can do in working with these companies on what their priorities are. So, because construction is underway um, and we have been able to have so much progress on that, we have turned the conversation to mobility. We took a little bit of a different approach, and I'm going to explain all of this that's up here, but CDOT and NCDOT were great partners with us in working through this. And when you're building out a campus of this size, um, a typical traffic analysis could lead to a lot of minor turn lane here, signals here, and that kind of thing. And we really worked closely. I want to give a shout out to Liz and Ed um, and CDOT because they were great partners with us through this. But we really said, okay, what do we need to do for the campus itself? And then what are potentially regional improvements that we can partner with Centene to make? Obviously, they're going to be mobilized out on site 
for quite some time. And so how do we work together in getting some of those regional improvements that don't just benefit the Centene campus, but benefit um, the traffic in the larger area? We landed on two, uh, the Claude Freeman intersection and then the interchange with Mallard Creek in 85. And right now those two projects together are about 13 and a half million. And so what we're gonna propose tonight is that we partner with them and we, through CIP reimbursement, reimburse them up to half of the cost of these intersections. Because again, it wasn't something that we said in working with CDOT and CDOT that we were gonna put on some team by themselves. It's important to note that they probably have at least another 30 million of offsite improvements that are happening in the area. So it's not just these two, um, but a whole other array, but again, this was trying to take the partnership to a new level and say, what can we do together that will improve um, mobility out there altogether? So these are important because then, you'll, you'll see on the screen, is you have two, um, the two intersections I just mentioned are circled in yellow. This we turn then to NCDOT and CDOT to make sure that the new bridge is what you see in um, green there can stay on track. This is a bridge that has been in the works for quite a long time. And why it's important is because it makes a very easy connection between the um, Blue Line station that's right on the outside of UNCC, between UNCC and Atrium, and the Research Park. The Research Park and the west side of 85, in that small condensed area, employ more people than Ballantyne. So just think about it, we're so close in terms of that connection to transit, but sometimes if you think about the congestion on Harris or the congestion on Mallet Creek, we could be so far away and connecting those jobs with the transit. And so again, working in partnership, getting those two intersections done, then um, making sure that the bridge over 85 can stay on track. I will say that the interchange um, at 85 and Mallard Creek was a newly identified, goes back to a couple years ago, um, project with NCDOT, but again, it was at the bottom of the list. It was gonna be a very long time before it could be done. And that leads us to then be able to focus on mobility and think about what, once the bridge is in, and the timing of the bridge, initial target on that bridge was uh, late 2024, it's probably in 2025 now, um, but they've been working through that to, again, push it to align with the Centene campus as much as possible. Um, but it allows us to think about how could we creatively look at last mile connections. And so we've looked at the connections to the Greenway and the Greenway into the research park, but then also can we get creative with something like autonomous vehicles in this last mile or different modes of transportation. And so what Centene, and this all came from Centene, um, started to again think about how can we partner and how can we be the pilot for what a mobility hub might look like in the research campus and then how do we go and talk to the other partners who are in the research park, UTIA Cref, Wells Fargo, all these other partners if we have a model and they develop a model for that. So that is really where we're trying to build this partnership to. But we got to start again with these inter intersection improvements that I mentioned tonight. And so what we would like to do is in November, um, before Thanksgiving, come back to you for an agreement to reimburse for up to 50% of the construction cost, up to 6.6 .6 million CIP funding for the two intersections that I gave you. Why it's critical now, again, they're out there, they're on site, they're mobilized, they can get this work done and completed before they open their first phase in August of 22. This also keeps, in, um, keeps pressure on moving that North Bridge forward, which I have explained is a critical mobility connection, not just for Centene, but all the employers in the research park and connecting to light rail. And this also allows us to continue down the road of the mobility plan that I mentioned um, with those little mobility hubs. So with that, I went really fast, I apologize, but I know y'all have a lot to cover. Um, I, I, I do have a question then. Braxton and Dimple. Um, with the, the reimbursement for 50% of the construction cost, you said is critical get, to get going now. 
But that's not for the bridge at all. It's for those two intersections, correct? It's for the two intersections, yeah. And with the state of DOT right now, how is that matched up that we need that right away when it's so far down the line? So, well, well, that's exactly what it was. I mean, I think, and this goes back to my time on the DOT board, actually, when I was working on this inter interchange, because we were seeing problems that were rising from increased development up in this area for that interchange, but it wasn't a project um, on NCDOT, NCDOT's kind of project list. What we had and said were these real little incremental fixes of the interchange. And so, <clears throat> What we said when we brought this, when this came forward, I think in years after I came off the board, it did actually become a project. But again, it was a relatively new project in the scheme of NCDOT. And so what we said with Centene was, hey, is there a way to partner on this to get the improvements done sooner rather than later? Because there's already a need out there now um, with that interchange, sooner rather than later. The next phone call was to then NCDOT to say, please tell us you're keeping the funding for the 85 bridge on track, right? Because yeah. all of these things together really solve some issues that we could have out there and create some new opportunities for mobility. Okay, thank you, uh, Tracy. Mr. Winston? The, um, no, the uh, possibility of moving that bridge forward on uh, cro across 85 was one of the many reasons why, you know, the Centene project made, made sense. Um, so I'm a little, just a little confused. Can you explain to me like a, Fifth grader, why does moving forward on these two intersections keep North Bridge moving forward? So it's, it, I guess where, I, it was the conversation that we had with NCDOT to say, look, we recognize, we're suggesting that we make improvements to an interchange that is, a, that is an issue out here today um, that's low on your project list, right? So we see that opportunity in turn please tell us that you're not gonna delay funding on the bridge that then would delay the bridge. And so that was the kind of conversations that uh, we started. So we're at. stepping in on some intersections that we would otherwise need to wait on the state to, to fix. And because yeah. of that, where it's, it's basically a coalition building, we can all kind of move forward on, on, on all things. That makes sense. Um, so, <clears throat> and another, another um, uh, reason why the Centene deal made sense was because of this p potential of this mobility hub, right? Um, one, I'd like to see a protected bike lane in that rendering and not just an open one. But two, um, what kind of, I understand that we're not necessarily moving on this before Thanksgiving, the bridge portion. Can we make any type, can we make commitments or to that this will be a, mo a, a, a kind of mobility, not just hub, but this, this stretch of road, will be able to utilize autonomous vehicles, will be connected, will be designed um, with that in mind? Can we tie that, th that future desire to the construction of this bridge? Um, well, I, and I will check with General Services and, and see that I think the design of the bridge we have been talking about how do we protect this? How do we make this work? Because I know we spent a lot of time, for example, the Greenway Tunnel under 85 exists right now today um, that, ta that connects the east side of 85 and the west side to the research part. That exists today. So we looked at all kinds of modes. What could we utilize today? Problem we have is that tunnel's not, but so big. And so then that led us to, let's make sure we don't have the same problem on, on the bridge. Well, I guess what I'm just saying is, how do we make our aspirations? How do we say, you know, commit to those aspirations and not just say this is a possibility if we move forward? How do we commit to say this is what we're going to do? And it doesn't have to be answered right here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Esmira. Thank you, Mayor Mary Putin. Um, so, a couple of questions. So, for two intersections that are uh, that are included in Phase One, are those on state maintained road? Mallard Creek Church is a state maintained road. So, yes. would so if it wasn't for this project, would it have been state's responsibility? So, what you were going to end up with again? So, I'll, I'll stick with the interchange for a second is that you were gonna have incremental improvements that were divvied out to various developers as development occurred. 
the state had identified the interchange as a project, but it was most likely far off because it only in the past couple of years has been identified as a project. So we were going to get on this interchange um, incremental improvements, turn lane here, turn lane there, not a real fix to the interchange. And so that was what we wanted to do with this is come back and say, okay, if we have a chance to get it right and we have a partner to get it right and a partner's going to carry half the cost for us, then should we, should we do this? And then the, the give to NCDOT, like I said, was to say, if we fix this interchange and we find a good solution to this interchange, you then keep your commitments to the bridge, and which is, which is very beneficial to, to us in that connection to light rail. So, so to follow up on that, Tracy, um, so are we um, taking on the cost the, for half, uh, half this, I know the half is being paid by Centene, but other half is it coming from the CIP? Yes. Um, so otherwise it would have come from the state, is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Eventually. <laughs> yeah, which, which I know that DOT has its, has its own funding issues and so on. But, I mean, it's good to see that it's been expedited as a result. Um, but still, I guess at the end of the day, we are picking up uh, half the cost. So, uh, so going back to $6.6 .6 million in CIP funding, is that coming from the private and public bucket so it's not affecting any of our other CIP projects that are underway correct okay. correct thank you thank you mr. Phipps yeah um, is there a movement afoot to try to identify any shovel ready projects that might benefit from the passage of the infrastructure bill and if this project could be one of them that could be considered shovel ready for use of potential use of such funds we are um working and i don't want to steal dana's thunder when he talks about the legislative agenda but um we're working to identify projects i think the timeline that this one is on maybe not it's worth it's worth looking into to just confirm um but i would say that this one's probably ahead of the game we've already done some uh, centine's taken on the cost of doing some significant design work to make sure that we can make everything work for the city and the state in terms of the improvements we do. Um, but it's, it's worth asking. But then also to your question, um, we have been working, and Dana and I had a conversation just as early as today, um, as recent as today, excuse me, about how do we create teams to look at all these different opportunities with the bipartisan bill. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you for the presentation and the update. Uh, Centene is a wonderful partner in District 4. I just wanted to know, because we've talked about the last mile solution for a long time with some of the current employers and on the University City Partners Board, are we en engaging with the other large employers such as Wells Fargo and, and you know, TIAA? Is there, a, um, is there a committee or how are you coordinating the, the project with the current. So I would say that's some of the next steps. Um, and, you know, some of this work, we were trying to get things in or, to happen in order. Um, and I had talked to um, University City Partners about can they help in pulling those partners. A lot of them are already on the board, right? Um, Centene wants to stand up and, you know, talk about the commitment that they want to make in these mobility hubs. Um, but we have to kind of get some of these other little pieces organized that I walked through. Um, we have to get them organized first, but that's kind of coming up. Um, there's a lot of work, I would say, to be done before the bridge delivers in building those partnerships, and that's really the next step. Thank you. Mr. Driggs? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Good evening. Um, do we know what bond cycles the CIP would occur in? I've looked at it in two from 2022 and 2024. With a lot of these projects, I like to, to spread them out. And uh, we, we saw a kind of a, a projection of uh, capital expenditures, uh, I guess, in our retreat. So where, where do these amounts appear in there? Are they already incorporated in that? So I think, and you want to take that? Uh, so Councilman Driggs, <clears throat> um, 
I think we had a, a brief conversation about this maybe a couple of weeks ago. So what we have, as Councilmember Ashmira alluded to, we have capacity in the 2022 bond cycle of $11 million and capacity in the 2024 bond cycle of $26 million for these types of projects. Tracy, one of the things that happened when she first came on board, she said, we're not as nimble as we could be in terms of having capacity when these types of deals come along. So that's what we have over the next two bond cycles. So these are residuals. They come from the residuals uh, that were left in the projection that we saw. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I heard and, and I share a, a little bit of a concern about us stepping up and paying for something that is an NCDOT liability. Uh, and that's for two reasons. For one, it, it sets a precedent, I think. And I worry uh, that um, they'll then kind of draw a conclusion from that. And the other thing is it sends a message. And the message is Charlotte can afford to pay itself. The state is grappling with needs all around the state where there isn't a local alternative. So are we inviting uh, an attitude on the part of NCDOT that our projects uh, can be deferred because if it gets really critical, we'll just pay for it ourselves? So what I would say is I don't think we'd be having this conversation if it wasn't for wanting to ensure that the bridge and NCDOT's <coughs> DOT's commitment, especially in this time where they're so fiscally constrained, um, that if the bridge wasn't a part of the conversation, I don't know that we would be having the same conversation. Um, again, this really started with, and the, the work that we did with CDOT and NCDOT is looking at all the roads around the research park are state roads. And all of those roads are very congested. And so, you know, we want to continue to recruit businesses or have the opportunities like Centene. We wanted to step back and say, we've got a partner in Centene. Um, what is something that we can do together that has a bigger regional impact? So, Councilmember Driggs, I understand the concern, but I think that if we weren't trying to solve multiple things and, and were concerned that the bridge wouldn't stay on schedule, I think we wouldn't be having that, but I think if we said we can solve, start to solve the interchange, the Harris interchange is something we cannot solve. Um, and the congestion at that interchange is something we can't solve. But we felt like with a partnership here, we could solve that, keep the bridge on schedule and on track and funded, um, and then let the state work on some of the other projects that are around there as well. But we are paying a high price just to induce NCDOT not to change the schedule for the bridge, isn't that right? To keep the bridge funded also. Yeah, but, but I mean, it is actually in the pipeline for funding. We're, we're saying if you don't remove that funding, we will pay for this other thing. And, and the other question is, did we look at uh, a TIG or did we look at a, a small-scale version of the uh, I-77 type of solution? Uh, the idea that we're just writing a check for this strikes me as being uh, expensive if there isn't, uh, you know, another way. Is there really no other way? So we did not look at the TIG only because of their business investment grant. And also I need the county to participate in the TIG component of it as well. And so the business investment grant and the TIG are the same mechanism really when you get down to it where it's a, it's a tax rebate from new property taxes that are created. And the big, I can't remember right offhand if the big was at, I think the big was at 90%. So it would have been. So they don't have tax capacity for us to try to apply to it. To look at it from. Um, okay, this is just a briefing tonight. I guess we can talk some more. I, 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 I'm really nervous about the precedent. I know what the attitude is in Raleigh, you know, Charlotte is rich uh, and it's the same thing. Uh, when it comes to schools and other areas where there's a shortage of funding, the courts, you know, there's always this idea, well, Charlotte can just step up, they have the money. And the truth is we don't. I mean, we have a lot of needs that we're trying to meet here. And so, um, all right, that, that's my comment for the moment. We can talk about it some more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Um, I, I think Ms. Uh, Ashmira and Mr. Driggs um, bring up an excellent point um, I think something that we should consider um, um, dealing with. Uh, I think I think these were some of the concerns when we, we talk when we kind of uh, focus in on some of the concerns around the 2040 plan, 
um, and 10 minute neighborhoods in different parts of town. When we talk about this vision zero, when we talk about reimagining roads, thank you, Ms. Ajmira, one, um, again for asking the right question um, in the retreat last week to get this information from staff when it looks like we're going to have to, if we're going to do some of the things that we talk about, we have to consider the points that Mr. Driggs and Ms. Ajmira are coming up with. Um, is this something that we just do one off or is this something that we create a policy for? Do we try to work out some type of MOU with the Department of Transportation that, you know, uh, that, that allows us to deal with the growth of our city um, uh, but doesn't give us an undue burden uh, from other parts of the state? I think this is a serious issue that we have to deal with um, and we should find a way to deal with it in committee and, 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 and write policy around it. I hope we can find a way to push that forward. Yep. Mr. Winston, uh, to your point, <clears throat> and maybe it's good to uh, have Liz perhaps and at some point come to the committee or the council because there are a number of projects that, um, if you want to use the term, you know, value engineering or things that that nature that we're dealing with. And there are some standards that we have committed to our community that are not being reflected, if I have this right, Tracy, in some of the things that we're seeing. So I totally agree with you. I guess to conclude, um, I, I don't want to just leave this as we should do this. How, how can we, because uh, we have three council members that have concerns about this. How do we move this policy conversation forward from this point? What's that? Can't hear you, sorry. Just a minute, we'll, we'll go in order. Uh, Mr. Eggleston, do you? Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate the point and don't disagree with the point. I guess I wonder what's the what's the alternative if we don't do this? Do we just say, well, our plan is off course, it's out of our control, it'll happen when it happens? That was for you, Ms. Dodson. I mean, that could be an option is we just say, like, this is a state project. We 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 wait, but I think you just, you're compounding the congestion. And, you know, one of the things, again, I learned my time on NCDOT's board, behind Texas, North Carolina has the most state-owned roads of any other state in the country. And so when we start to talk about things and work off interstates and things like that, and the fact that if you look at the research park, and actually until recently, the research park roads were state roads, um, we don't have, they're all state roads surrounding there. So the congestion that, that's up there, if we don't find ways to, and I'm gonna emphasize the partner um, on some of these improvements, uh, yeah, you may have to sit and wait and that could potentially choke out other opportunities. I mean, it, it could be a discussion worthy of taking up at some point more broadly around the impacts of I mean, that's a pretty staggering statistic that we're second in the nation in state roads to Texas. Um, and I'm sure that there are pros to that and there are certainly cons to that. So I, that, that might be a worthwhile academic discussion for us to have in terms of what challenges does that pose to us and how can we react to them. But um, I don't, for the reasons that were stated, I, I, I think it could set a precedent. At the same time, I hate for us to throw a wrench in a partnership and an agreement and pro all this progress that's being made um, without really having any control over the timeline. So I don't know that that helps solve anything, but I think it's a dilemma. Uh, Mr. Phipps. Thank you, uh, Madam Pro Tem. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier uh, about um, as development occurs, and I'm familiar, you know, with development in an area and uh, agreements that were struck with several developers to uh, uh, assist in a portion of the expense of some of these interchanges up there. Uh, is that still a possibility that we would look to development up uh, in that area to assist with some of these uh, intersection improvements uh, to the extent that they're development would impact Mallet Creek and those intersections up there? So you had, specific to the interchange, what you had was you had a couple of different developments that had minor improvements to the interchange. 
And the question was, when were those going to happen? And they were going to happen incrementally, right? It wasn't going to happen until one of those developments happened and you wait for the next one and the next one and the next one. And so what we've tried to do is look at this partnership with what are some of, potentially even reprioritizing some of the improvements of other developments, taking it away from the interchange and more re-emphasizing some other improvements that other developments needed to happen away from the interchange, still like on Mallard Creek Church, um, but so that it happened in a sequence that made more sense for the bigger picture up there. Um, so this is not letting anybody out of what they're committed to. It's more about reorganizing in a way that was more thoughtful in working with everybody at the table, but also achieving kind of what we felt like was the big regional improvement that needed to happen for the area up there. And I have to say, Tracy, at some point it would even be helpful to get someone to present to us DOT perspective because, you know, we always have to keep it in perspective here, what we're really talking about. When we talk about our projects around here, the Silver Line's $13 billion, right? The whole DOT state budget is $8 billion. And, you know, I, I just, we get really kind of wrapped up in what our needs are here and what we're working on. And it's just, um, it's in stark contrast to what the needs are throughout the state. You've got the I-77 project in Matthews right now that is in the works. That's like at the top of the, of the list for DOT projects. And they're getting value engineered right now, and they're, they're livid. So it's not even a matter of this project coming up the queue. It's if it even gets done to the if it gets done and if it gets done to the extent that it was planned. I think that's what we're really talking about here, which is it's a difficult conversation. So it's almost like we've got to make a, we have to prioritize the most important projects here. We did this when you're talking about criminal justice and what they do to our DEA's office regularly. We did this years ago. We said, well, we're going to take care of this situation, our criminal justice system here in Charlotte if the state's not going to. And at some point, you might have to have a conversation like that about transportation. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it, you know, Mr. Manager, you might have suggestions on this, on how we can handle this, because it, obviously it needs a, a, a broader conversation. Yes, I would like to put out that um, we use our strategy sessions, the first Monday of the month for items like this. And I'd love to put this on the December strategy session for a full-blown discussion. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, is that good with everybody? Can we go yeah. ahead and move yeah. on? Okay. Oh, okay, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, I'd like to see it in the December strategy session because uh, I'd also want to consider the number of state-owned roads in District 4. Like you said, it's, you know, we're second compared to Texas. Could we get a list of uh, districts with the, uh, the number of state-owned roads in the the, num the different districts? I'll see if CDOT can pull that. Thank you, because I mean, I run into this challenge when it comes to litter and traffic yeah. and lighting, yep. you know? Street yeah, street lights, <laughs> I mean, and everything in, in, in District 4, the, the grass, grass mowing. So it's certainly something that I would like to see a policy um, surrounding if there's a way, and, and to me, this looks like a creative solution. I'd like to see more of it if we could have public-private partners to, to solve some of the issues that we have instead of less. I mean, if it's just because we've always done it a certain way, if there's an opportunity to address the issues, I think we should definitely take a look at that. You said that this, the research park area has more jobs than Ballantyne. Yeah. So there are certain specific issues that we need to take a look at and be creative in solving. Traffic is a problem in the District 4 area, and I would just love to see um, us, us utilize these partners that are coming to the table. Okay. I, I, and I think Mr. Winston was going to mention that there is a map upstairs of state-owned roads um, by district. Well, it's on the map. Yeah, so. we have a big map on the wall. But that we has could get an update on the list of that. I, I believe the number is 2,200 miles of state-owned roads in this state. And to that point, you know, Moorhead is a state-owned road. Mm -hmm. And we desperately mo need Moorhead to be fixed. So I guess it's even a question uh, as to whether they, some of these roads should still be state-owned if they're that critical to us. 
and we need, you know, those improvements. But we'll save that for the strategy session. So thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, Mr. Manager, do you want to lead with that? Sure. We, we have Dana Fenton who will come in and talk about the legislative strategy. And I'm not sure if we're going straight to Dana or to our two co-chairs. Straight to Dana. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, City Manager. I'm pleased to be here tonight. Uh, for the record, my name is Dana Fenton. I'm the City's Intergovernmental Relations Manager. And uh, I'm not only here tonight to uh, present the uh, proposed 2022 federal and state legislative agendas that are recommended to you by the Intergovernmental Relations Committee, but I'm also here, I'm really happy. Three nights ago, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Plan, it puts a lot of new funding into whether it's transportation, aviation, digital inclusion, sustainability, resiliency, drinking water, and other needs uh, that we have in this country, and in fact, in our city as well. So if I seem a little uppy tonight, uh, you will know my endorphins are jumping right now. So, uh, go back to uh, yeah, slide two. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, your Intergovernmental Relations Committee, led by co-chairs Bakari and Winston, have been very busy this fall. Uh, the committee has met twice, September and October. And in October, they filled one of their most major responsibilities by recommending the proposed legislative agendas before you tonight for the consideration of the council. And we're planning to come back in two weeks uh, for the formal consideration by the city council. But let me state up front that if there are additional issues that the council would like the committee to consider before the November 22nd date, then that could be done next week, November 15th at the Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, again, I think we talked last year, we've talked actually every year about legislative agendas, of course, but of course, a legislative agenda's purpose is to communicate your uh, legislative goals for uh, the upcoming year to the Congress and to the North Carolina General Assembly. And in 2022, both, both of those uh, houses will be focusing on a limited selection of work, uh, mainly finishing up work that's left over or remaining from 2021. They'll also have to be considering some budget matters. And at the state, the General Assembly is going to have to be looking at uh, implementing new state policies and appropriating funds that will be coming to the state from the uh, bipartisan infrastructure plan. And of course, at the General Assembly, we know this very well, we will have to play defense. That, that's true in every session, whenever the General Assembly gets together. So the 2022 legislative agendas recommended by the committee to you uh, really fit in with what uh, we can be expecting next year. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed federal legislative agenda includes uh, two items. The first one is infrastructure and in, in, in community needs. And this really represents a pivot. For the last four years, the city council has been strongly advocating for new federal resources for infrastructure like aviation, public transportation, rail, highway, digital inclusion, sustainability, resiliency, and so forth. And now they've come through with it. And so the, the transition next year, the pivot, will be to uh, uh, compete for that funding. There's going to be a lot of grant opportunities uh, that will be available to local governments around the country, and along with a lot of other groups like states uh, and uh, metropolitan planning organizations. We also have built into the infrastructure and community needs position some of the possible areas that we could access through, through a potential Build Back Better Act, the second prong human inf infrastructure plan. Uh, as of right now, the, the, the uh, House will be considering that in the next few weeks. Uh, in the second position, comprehensive immigration reform, this is essentially the same as the last three years. And the, uh, we thought earlier this year that they might be able to do something about immigration reform. There was an attempt to uh, address that through the budget reconciliation package, but it was ruled out of order by the Senate parliamentarian. And let's transition to the next slide, the state legislative request. 
Uh, the first item here is mobility. This is the same position as you have in the current year's agenda. And I was listening to the, uh, to the discussion from the Centene uh, uh, presentation, and I heard a lot about the state uh, and, the, and the troubles they have with funding transportation. So that, that is in here, not just revenues for state, but also regional and local projects. And then we have uh, what I call the fraternal twin in the state legislative agenda for the infrastructure and community needs. It's slightly different. It's really uh, geared more towards the revenues uh, or the resources the state will be able to receive from the federal government and then distribute to local governments and other groups around the state. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next step, uh, again, the Intergovernmental Relations Committee meets next week, and they could consider any additional issues you have that you'd like to have uh, considered for inclusion in the agendas. And we can make those recommendations in time for November 22nd. And then following that, uh, going to the new year, we are uh, penciled in tentatively briefings uh, for our congressional and state delegations. And again, uh, you all have taken the opportunity there to be really strong advocates uh, for the needs that we have. And I just want to commend you, for the, again, for the last four years, we have added in our legislative agenda something about infrastructure, uh, all the different modes, not just transit or aviation, for example. You all have been very, very strong advocates for it. And it's, it's, it's uh, taken four years, but it's come to fruition. So with that uh, pro tem, I would be glad to uh, uh, stand for any questions that council may have. Thank you, Mr. Fenton. We do have some questions tonight. I'm going to start with our intergovernmental co-chair, Mr. Bakari. Thank you. Um, I, I think the, the punchline on today's uh, presentation, and this goes back to what we discussed in committee, um, is there is the framework at a super high level. It's nothing shocker. It's been the same for a lot of years in that way. Um, there is a call to action amongst us council members in parallel to a call to action amongst staff members. Staff will be bringing back, as they normally do, their specific items that rise up through departments that are specific in there. Um, and, and I think as we've done this for a while, we've gotten good at here's how we come to a conclusion at some high levels, here's how we sit in front of these congressmen and women and folks in the delegation um, and say, hey, this is what we care about at a macro level. Um, our next frontier is getting specific underneath those items and measuring what legislation we create or what outcomes we cause. So I, I know that we've got a thousand things on all of our plates, um, but I, I highly, uh, on behalf of, of Braxton and myself, highly um, request that you, um, particularly in your committees, where again, that covers all the scope of everything we, we have, look at those buckets and give us examples next week of specifics. Um, look at what buckets are, might be missing because all of that's gonna be great and we're all gonna get a great check the box after we're done and everyone's gonna feel real happy. But at that level, there's not a ton of detail that we measure our success. So if everyone can kind of come up with their items within a good start of a framework that we're all familiar with, um, we'll, merit, we'll weigh the merits of all of those because if we can agree to it as a council, and again, this is the most powerful part of intergovernmental relations, if we can agree to an item with at least six votes or more, then we get to formally advocate for it. And, and I think that will make the difference at this next level. And I don't know if you have anything to add. No, no, I, I, I completely uh, agree um, with Mr. Bakari. Um, we, I think we've really worked hard over the past couple of years to expand this le legislative agenda and, and really, you know, deal with some difficult um, topics. Look, if I can get in front of Dan Bishop and talk about um, uh, comprehensive immigration reform and he can and go and talk to um, Alma Adams about the same thing and we do it from the uh, uh, council's perspective as opposed to our individual perspective, that is a very powerful thing. So um, thank you all for the past work that we've done it. If you have anything to add, now is, is really the time so we can get to work you know, on behalf of the city. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam, Madam Mayor. Our pro tem. If we can go back to the federal slide, and, and I guess the first question is, and I, I think you, you, you touched on it, so are these grants to the state, which comes to the city, are there 
opportunities for the city to, to, to request specific funding? And what are you hearing in reference to the timeline of the funds actually coming here on the ground? Uh, great question, Mr. Graham. Uh, we have all sorts of funding that would be made available, whether through competitive grants or direct allocations uh, to both states and local governments. Um, well, actually, for the most part, the, the direct allocations would be made to the state. Uh, there are some grants, even uh, the funding that would go to the states, where the state could then turn around and have a grant-making uh, process to distribute that funding around the state. Uh, in other cases, they would allocate it, uh, probably based upon current formulas, like, for example, in the highway programs. We have the uh, STI program that looks at data to get that funding out, and I'm, I'm sure they would probably follow a similar process for that. Um, and in terms of uh, your, the big question about when these opportunities will be coming out, you may see a few of these come out in January and February, but we expect a lot more in March and uh, later on in the year. And in some cases, let me also make sure all of you are aware that um, especially this, the funding that would go to the states for distribution, uh, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of steps in that process because you have to go through you know, uh, another level of government to get the funding down to ultimately who would receive the funding. So it, could take, it would probably take longer than what you would see for the federal grants, the federal competitive grants that we could apply for. And, and Mr. Manager, do you have like a cheat sheet? Because I'm looking at the areas that I kind of play in the most, which would be the affordable housing, workforce development, community development, public safety. Is there a cheat sheet that you guys are establishing internally in terms of a wish list um, that you are kind of putting in a parking lot ready for the um, grants and those things to kind of make themselves available to us? Thank you, Councilmember Graham. So I, I believe Dana has uh, created the framework for all of the opportunities for funding by department by area. And so what's occurring is that all of the department heads with Dana and the ACMs are coming together to see if there are, is some, are some opportunities for collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've been attacking it. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that I believe we could probably get a team that's full-time, that that's all they do, and not necessarily city employees, to make sure that we're not missing something. Because mm -hmm. so I'm looking at the, com the community development in particular, and displacement is something that we're going to talk about a lot, I believe, mm -hmm. next year. And if there's any grant opportunities around that in particular, I think that would be really, really helpful as we begin to, to start that work. But certainly, uh, this is something that I, I, I really, really want to make sure that we capitalize on, mm -hmm. certainly in reference to the transportation and transit. That's where I think we can really um, make the mark, but I don't want to lose any any focus on those lower areas, lower in terms of priority, I guess, transportation is what we really, really need resources for, um, for our highways and um, corridors, et cetera. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Driggs, and then Ms. Ajmira. Thank you. Good evening, Dana. Um, Good evening. Is this still subject to Senate approval? The, the bill passed the Senate in August, and it was passed by the House on Friday night with no changes whatsoever. So it's adopted. So it's, it's on its way to the, to the president for signature. Right. I doubt that he'll veto it, so uh, I think we're in business. Um, the, uh, what would be the timeline for the disbursement of the funds? I mean, you were saying something about March and so on. So is it the intention that the commitments will be made of these monies in the course of the coming year? Yes, Mr. Riggs, that's a really good question, too. I elaborate on my answer to Mr. Graham. Uh, the competitive grant opportunities from the federal government, we should be hearing about those starting in the first quarter of 2022. The, the, the funding that goes as direct allocation, uh, I'm not sure when that would be distributed, but it's supposed to be for sometime in fiscal year 22. That, that is what, that's what we have been told. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, it, we did make a projection as to when some of the grants from the bipartisan plan would be, we'd be receiving notices of funding opportunities. But that's still, still in a lot of ways, still highly speculative. But I do believe that we'll be seeing some uh, come out in the first quarter of 2022. 
Right, because to, to the agendas here, a couple of people have commented already, this is an incredibly broad brush, right? And we go in and we say we'd like money for all these uses, and they're going to say, sure, wouldn't everybody? So uh, I think if we can uh, think about what we're going to be applying for, I know the mayor has tried to do some groundwork to, put, to position us mm -hmm. uh, to be beneficiaries of this, but uh, just on the back of the envelope, I guess you would expect about uh, 30 billion of this on a pro rata basis to come to North Carolina and uh, maybe a tenth of that to Charlotte, roughly? Is that? Well, uh, yeah, that's a really, that's a really speculative question to answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, but, uh, <laughs> but, but also, uh, um, uh, I, I would love it if we got a pro rate share, of course, but, um, <laughs> but, but seriously, um, yeah, I really can't answer that question uh, truthfully. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to think about um, how much we can hope for in terms of getting mm -hmm. the ambitions that we have mm -hmm. uh, addressed by this program. It's about a trillion one still, is that right? Yeah, the bipartisan plan is 1.2 trillion. All right. And, and if I could uh, uh, just clarify for council that uh, this position, and just like the state position, includes not just opportunities that are in the bipartisan plan, but that are also in the projected Build Back Better Act. That's the second prong plan that is the subject of negotiations right now in the House, and it, there will be negotiations with the Senate on that. So it's, I certainly think if we had some shiny projects that we could dazzle our legislators with uh, when we go and talk to them, to, to your point, um, that uh, in the in the jostling for position to get this money, we'll be in a, in a better location. Yeah, but, uh, that's, that's true. That's true. And okay. and I would just say that our delegation, especially our congressional delegation, they're on top of these things. Uh, whenever we uh, compete for grants, or if we want to enter into, uh, for example, when we did the capital investment grants process for the, both blue lines and for um, uh, the gold line that uh, they were very, very responsive and they were of help every step of the way. Uh, so I look forward to that. If I can also say, Mr. Driggs, uh, let me just clarify for council too, is that the last um, uh, four items in this position, affordable housing, workforce development, community development, and public safety are areas that are we've identified tentatively in the Build Back Better Act. So uh, we could very well have some more to add in there but uh, as of right now, that's all we see uh, in there. So the, other, the others are all part of the bipartisan plan. But I would be glad to get a fuller accounting of that uh, to the council in my next weekly update. Yeah, I just think time is of the essence. So uh, the sooner we can get in there with uh, specific uh, requests and start making applications, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Oh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I just promoted you. <laughs> um, to follow up on Mr. Drake's question, um, in terms of how the funding will be distributed, that's not something you can answer, but is there a methodology that I think we can all agree to, to advocate for, mm -hmm. to prioritize some of the projects that we have in the pipeline? I think that's the methodology that I would like uh, Mr. Jones to tell us what methodology that we as a council can advocate for projects that we have in the pipeline that are high priority, right? Um, uh, Ms. Babson did a great job uh, getting entire list out to us, right? That includes all our sidewalks, street lights, and so many of them are in red, which means they're not funded. And majority of them, majority of them are in district, uh, district two, three, four, and District 7, mm -hmm. uh, and some in District 5. So, uh, you know, we, we got to figure out a way to address those issues that are absolutely critical right now because we are looking at fatality, crashes, and so on, and some of this is contributing to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would like to see what methodology that we can use to um, mm -hmm. to get our fair share of the infrastructure funding. Uh, so for that, I'm, I'm waiting for the guidance from uh, Mr. Jones on that. Uh, second, on the immigration reform, uh, in past couple of months, we 
uh, I have received a lot of emails from H-1B visa holders and their spouses. Mm -hmm. Because of the delays in the processing time because of COVID, a lot of those H-1B visa holders have been struggling. And I, uh, I mean, it, it's, it has been very frustrating uh, where their visa is about to expire. However, the processing and delay in that, there, is, there has not been any solution. So I want to see, uh, I know the immigration reform is still underway, but is there some sort of solution for these folks who majority of them are employed in Research Park or Ballantyne area, right, uh, important part um, of our economy? How, how do we really address uh, the issue that we have here in terms of the visa that's currently on hold um, and also for their spouses. Yeah. Well, that, the, the streamlining and the, and, the, and the issue with the spouses working is part of, our, our, the, of your current federal legislative agenda and, uh, and are in this uh, position uh, tonight for your consideration. Um, I would say that uh, I would have to answer your question by saying, I'd like to go back and take a look at what I've seen of the Build Back Better Act. There may be something in there related to H-1B visas. I know there was something about some unused visas, and I would need to check with that and also with Federico Rios on that. Um, and um, if I could have some time to do that uh, next couple of days, I, would, I, I think that would be helpful for me. Yes, that would be very helpful because we have gotten, well, at least I have received multiple requests on that. and. Um, and, and it's, it's been very uh, frustrating. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and for the um, state legislative agenda, could you go back to that slide? The state slide? Yes, please. Next one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I see the infrastructure funding is already part of it, and I think some of that would include the discussion we had earlier on the transportation and so on. So. I, I will save my comments on that for our December strategy session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Phipps? Yeah, I have a, a simple question. Um, do we foresee a, a personal on-site uh, visit to D.C. to deliver our federal agenda? I hope it's personal this year, <laughs> this coming year. Um, because having to do Zoom meetings, I'm sure all of you are tired of those. It would be great to be able to talk with our delegation in person. But also, we we have to be mindful too of what the uh, what the rules are for uh, access uh, to federal buildings. Uh, the U.S. Congress makes its own rules. The federal government has its own rules too. Right now, those buildings are closed to the general public, and uh, and if you meet with them, you have to meet with them virtually. We'll follow the lead of the, like, the League of Municipalities and stuff like that. And likely, if that's allowed, then we're allowed to do it. And if not, then we won't. Mr. Driggs had a follow-up question. Yes, I'm just wondering, we, we worked on our mobility plan on the assumption that the federal government would cover 60% of the cost of the, uh, the uh, I don't know if it's the TMN or the Strategic Mobility Plan at this point, but, you know, a large amount. So uh, how does this relate to that? Would we view these funds as incremental to the sources that we thought we could rely on for that funding, or is this likely to end up being part of that funding? Yeah, the, the, uh, the funding for uh, capital investment grants is part of the bipartisan infrastructure plan. They provided a lot more funding in this next five years than what they had in the previous five years, a substantial increase for public transportation but they didn't make any changes to the formulas, so we'd be still at the same formulas that we've been uh, talking about for the last several months. Uh, and uh, either, if there's anything more I can answer for you, I'd be glad to. I might need I, to I get some assistance from Mr. Lewis. Does this Mr. bill Lewis. mean that we have more reason to be confident about being able to achieve our plan, or does it represent sources that might be available for other uses in addition? Yeah, the. Um, it certainly is, is a shot in the arm that there would be additional federal resources uh, that should if we were able to secure a local revenue source that should help us in, in securing it because the grants are still going to be, uh, you have to put some local dollars into it to get a project going. 
Yeah, I'm not assuming that we get around that. I'm just looking at the piece that we thought we'd get from the feds and wondering if this money is from, from old sources um, or if the money that we thought we were going to get is from old sources and we still expect to get that and therefore any distributions under the new bill would be available for other uses. Uh, under capital investment grants, it has to be used uh, for those types of projects. Uh, but, um, but again, I'll just, I'll just reiterate that, uh, again, there's a substantially more funding. I think it's at least eight, eight billion more uh, out of a base of 15 billion uh, for capital investment grants in the next five years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dana, I just have a quick question. Maybe it's <laughs> rhetorical, but uh, with the labor shortages that we're seeing throughout the country, has there been any um, momentum at all be behind accelerating immigration reform or this backlog of visas, knowing that we've got so many jobs, you know, blue collar and white collar jobs to fill? Yeah, I know that issue has been raised uh, in the committees, uh, but as of right now, it's, it's a very, uh, because the, the Senate margins is a 50-50 uh, body, 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans, and, and it's, it's really tough to get uh, legislation through uh, without going to a filibuster uh, or to prevent a filibuster from occurring. So um, I think it's going to be one of those issues that's going to be a tough one that's still going to have to be addressed at some point, but uh, it's right now. Uh, I, I couldn't really tell you uh, just how it's looking. I think even I, that was my first thought on the infrastructure bill is with all these areas, workforce development, housing, transportation, mm -hmm. that's going to take people <laughs> it to is. be filling those jobs to get these things done. So It, I, it is. I just give you a little, little bit of a, a um, spoiler alert on the uh, Build Back Better Act. There's about $20 billion in there for workforce development activities. Maybe that's going to go through the state of North Carolina. But uh, they're taking a look at uh, also uh, the needs, like in uh, surface transportation. What are you going to be needing to, to get these projects built and maintained by people here? But also, um, at the same time, um, I just lost my thought. I'm very sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I mean, there's people out there that want jobs, yeah. and they can't get jobs because we won't give them visas, and it just seems to be sort of a, a solution out there waiting to be That's true. adopted. And what you just said just triggered my memory, uh, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me just make sure you all know that the funding through the bipartisan plan will be made available over a five-year period. You, you can compete for grant opportunities. In for FY 22, uh, 23, and so forth through 26. It's not like the, uh, uh, the stimulus plan from 2009 where they wanted to get that money out the door right away. So, they're, they're look, so I think that we do have some time to, to consider those types of issues. Okay, thank you. And I, I, we have Ms. Johnson, and then we'll go ahead and wrap Just it up. Just to piggyback off your question, Mayor Pro Tem, speaking of people that want to work and aren't able to, I know there is some some talk about criminal justice reform mm -hmm. at a federal level. Is there any talk about um, maybe banning the box on a federal level or uh, some type of reform where individuals are able to obtain employment without the barrier of the criminal record? Yeah, and that specific issue, I, I can't really tell you. I know that a lot of states are, are proceeding on that course, uh, but uh, I would be glad to check that out for you. Thank you. Thank you. And then, okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Fenton. Um, we're going to move along because we still have an update on the policy map from the uh, Charlotte Future 2040, and then we'll need to get back down to get down to the chamber for a 6.30 start. So, uh, Mr. Manager. Th thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> and uh, you will also see on my 30-day uh, memo on the dais that there's another discussion that we'll have related to uh, the policy map update at the December strategy meeting. So I think it's important what Ty is going to focus on today is an update, but also some of the issues that arose during the community engagement. It's kind of this concept of what we've heard. So I think in the next you know, 15 minutes that could mm -hmm. be an update for council to be also a primer for the discussion for December, the first um, strategy session in December. Thank you very much, Manager Jones. 
Good evening, everyone. So I am joined by my colleague, Alicia Husband, who will um, take some of the, kind of present the substance of tonight. But the first couple of slides you've seen before, so I will not necessarily repeat them. Uh, but this slide is very important from the point of view of we've been looking at the comprehensive plan 2040, which was adopted back in June. So what the policy map is doing is really focusing on the place-based policies in that comprehensive plan and mapping them in different geographies throughout our city. But then you also see the two documents, uh, the Unified Development Ordinance and the Strategic Mobility Plan, which our colleagues at, um, within CDOT are working on in partnership with us. These are all initiatives that really bring to life the comprehensive plan uh, adopted back in uh, June. Next slide, uh, just kind of shares with you the timeline where we are today with regards to the policy map. Remember that we broke the engagement into three phases. The first phase was concluded October 1st, and then we received um, multiple responses to that from different parts of the community. The second phase is coming to an end this week, and we'll talk to you about that. And then the third phase will be when we release the second draft of the, uh, the second, the third phase actually will take us towards the end of December, and then the second draft of the policy map will be released in January. So I'll pitch this to Alicia to kind of go through the um, next few slides, and then we'll be here to take questions. But like Manager Jones said, we're not really going to dig into details. We'll have that opportunity when we come back to you in December. But what we did not want to do is to wait until the end of the second phase and not bring information back to you with regards to what we're hearing from the community and how we're responding to them. So Alicia. Thank you, Taiwo, um, Council and Manager Jones for the opportunity to share. Um, as Taiwo mentioned, um, the development phase um, for the policy map is kind of broken down into three parts. So the first phase and the engagement process mirrors that, that process for developing the policy map. So the policy map um, engagement um, started in July and ran through September of this year, and we kicked off a um, an online survey we mailed out and had online and hard copies mailed out to every resident within the city of Charlotte. We hosted over a hundred different events across the city to help promote the project and encourage participation in the survey. Um, for that, we had about 4,700 um, responses, really active participants in that phase of engagement. Phase two kicked off in October and will conclude next week. And um, the first part of that was a virtual information meeting, which was to um, essentially reveal to the first, the first draft of the, the future 2040 policy map and the Charlotte streets map. Um, it also was um, the meeting was to explain how the maps inform the built environment over time and how they relate to one another and just to provide general overall background information on, on how each map was developed. And so following that information meeting, we've been hosting a ser series of community conversations um, throughout the city um, about the policy map rec recommendation. Ideally, we would have wanted to do these in person, but due to the Delta variant at the time, we felt the virtual conversations were safer for staff and for our residents. And the turnout has been a little different, not as much as we expected, but um, hopefully within the next week, um, that next week we will host um, our 36th and 7th conversation actually tomorrow. And next week we'll have an opportunity to meet in person at various um, locations throughout the city. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. Phase three begins um, in January, and then we'll have a second draft of the policy map. Next slide, please. So in terms of what we heard throughout the second phase of engagement about the draft policy map, uh, we can group those comments into five major themes. Um, we received first questions related to the intent of the policy map tool. What is, how are we gonna apply it? General questions about um, what's the purpose? And we don't think those um, types of responses will require change to the mapping approach. Instead, we will 
require an explanation um, and respond to those comments individually and provide those online and um, available on our website and we'll email those out and share those as we have um, with the last phase of the project and with this phase as well. The second um, theme that we've been hearing is about procedural and implementation questions about how will the map be applied, how does it relate to the UDO, the Unified Development Ordinance, districts, et cetera. Again, those questions don't necessarily require a map and approach change, but we'll just respond with some explanatory information um, when we provide those responses to the public. Next, we receive general questions about the draft policy map approach. These questions are more general in nature about how the current map and approach is structured or what was included, what were the considerations in developing the map. Um, and the challenging, um, the challenging thing about these is that some of those were made on the map itself and then some were in, in writing. So we'll begin to respond to those individually and consider um, these questions as, as resolved once we provide those responses. The last two categories of comments are related to changing the map and approach for the second draft. Um, the first bucket is related to adjusting the current steps in the map and approach for the second draft, making it more accurate. And then the second bucket is related to adding steps to the current map and approach um, to make um, the second draft more aligned with the vision and the comprehensive plan. And I'll walk through those in the next slide. So um, the next slide, I meant the two areas of, around um, what will, will actually change in terms of adjustments to the mapping approach. First is um, adjustments to improve accuracy to the map. Our zoning is a major input um, for the draft map where we took over 100 zoning districts that were translated to 10 place types. In some instances, those zoning districts uh, then clearly translate to one place type. And in these cases, we just use market analysis to determine what was the most viable place type assignment in the future. We all heard from the community that um, that translation isn't as accurate as we would like. So we're going to work to see if we can introduce more accurate information to make those trans translations more accurate in the next draft. The second issue we, um, we're seeing in terms of accuracy is related to how we group the parcels for large geographies and adjusting those thresholds. Um, and by doing that, we think we'll, we will resolve some of the accuracy as well in terms of the translation. The next adjustments are um, to the policy map approach. The mapping approach are related to aligning with the comprehensive plan. Looking at these three major land uses around manufacturing logistics, commercial uh, neighborhood activity, neighborhood one and neighborhood two, essentially, essentially trying to see if um, we can align that vision with what we know is on the ground today and aspirationally, how might those uses evolve to something that aligns closer with the call plan. So those are additional conversations that we'll be having um, to refine the second draft of the map. Next slide. So the uh, comments will be addressed using the following category. Comments related to the intent and application of the place types um, do not require an action and are already addressed in the draft policy map. Therefore, we will just um, consider those comments resolved, but make sure we communicate to those who made those comments to make sure that, um, that they're okay with that resolution. Um, comments related to implementation process and, and, and um, administration are typically addressed by other actions outside of the policy of MAP. So we'll make sure again that those comments are addressed um, to those individuals and will consider to be those resolved. And then finally, the last two buckets around adjustments for the accuracy of the MAP and the MAP for alignment with the plan and also translation from zoning to land use we will work with internal staff um, and other stakeholders to test those ideas and, and those criteria to make sure that they are reflected in the second draft of the map. Next slide. So again, I wanted to mention, um, these are some of the in-person opportunities that we will have um, next week, starting next week. Um, 
on Tuesday, tomorrow, actually, we'll have be wrapping up our community conversations, the virtual meetings that we've been having. This, that'll be 36 and 37. So we've had a total of 37 community conversations virtually across the community. Um, the in-person drop-in hours are very long hours from 11 to 7 in five different locations to make sure that there's an opportunity for people to meet with staff if they're not comfortable using the virtual option to actually meet with staff and have their questions answered. These locations were chosen because um, we looked at low participation rates across the city and we've been tracking those to see where we're getting feedback. And so we chose these locations to go out to those areas that haven't participated as much. We also included two opportunities at the government center to make sure that people can um, just meet centrally in the city for no matter where they are in the community. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank so you. So I wanted to much. wrap up just by also highlighting Ty. No, go on. Um, Did you say can, something? We can go back to the previous slide. I wanted to just highlight something quickly. If you okay. recall, Yes, sorry about that. If you recall, during the uh, new strategy session, you had indicated that respective council members would like to know when which meetings are taking place within their districts. We identified these particular ones, again, because of what she said, low turnout uh, in terms of participation during the community conversation. So this is not just a message to the community, but also to you as respective council members for these districts that it would be good for you to also join us, if you could, at some of these in-person meetings as well. Uh, two will be in District 1, uh, District 1, uh, District 2, District 3, and District 5, but also push the messaging out to your constituents because we want to be able to hear from all of them. These are in-person opportunities. And in addition to that, what Alicia um, will say is that we also have hard copies of these documents at all the libraries as well as YMCA's. So people actually don't have to necessarily go online to see what those policy maps are. Uh, but we've got two more slides to go, so Alicia, I'll pitch it back to you. Just wanted to make sure that we remind you of this, uh, that you should help us push the message on that. Thank you. Next slide, Alicia. So the last slide is just to highlight some um, some work that the planning department is leading um, parallel to the policy map. You all may recall that within the comprehensive plan, there were several community-led groups that were chartered to focus on specific topics around anti-displacement, infrastructure, and one of those groups was the community benefits um, conversation. And so we have been convening a task force um, just to, to extend um, that was conversations around community, how might we achieve community benefits through the development process in Charlotte. And so um, the, the Urban Land Institute over the summer uh, convened a group of lo local stakeholders that included community members and developers and regional experts around the topic just to begin to think and create um, some tools around how might we better and be more intentional about um, providing community benefits to the community um, during the development process. So this task force is just to lay the foundation and then to, to begin to build upon that work that was defined within the ULI um, study. And then we've had two workshops to date. Um, we've invited those same stakeholders that participated in that ULI study. And we've had um, about 50 people to participate um, 30 in the 20 in the first meeting and 31 in the second workshop that essentially it was around how might we, what ideas do we have and what is working today and what, what do we have today in our toolbox that we can build upon. That work will conclude with a, an action plan or lookbook that is co-created or co-designed by the task force to present to council um, uh, for further action um, next next winter, uh, next spring, for sure. So um, with that, I will take any questions that you might have about anything we presented tonight. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Tawo. Uh, Mr. Phipps has a question, and we'll just, if anyone else has a question, just let me know. 
Yeah, uh, given the comments you said about uh, lower than expected uh, uh, community turnout, do you detect any um, community uh, fatigue with the process and, and these meetings and such? Um, Alicia, maybe I can take that. That's, that's a good... Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, first of all, when we set up these community conversations, the intent was primarily designed for those who had questions about the place types draft map. Um, we did not expect that everybody would, but we expected that those who had specific questions and sought clarification. But at the same time, we also knew that so many other things were going on in the community. Um, strategic mobility plan, the unified development ordinance, you just had the redistricting public hearing. Definitely, it's possible for people to just, uh, you know, become fatigued. Uh, but we've tried as much as possible to make it as very um, enjoyable in terms of presentations, but also making sure that we kept presentation to a minimum and allow people to actually more like work sessions. So, you know, um, it could be part of that, but it could also be because there are those who attended are the ones who really had specific questions that they needed clarification on. And I, I sat on, I think out of the 30 somewhere we've had, I've sat in on probably 20 or so of them. Um, and they've been really very interesting conversations. But we've also had situations where people will participate in multiple just because they wanted more questions answered. And, that, and that's encouraging uh, as well. Now, we would definitely like to have more so hopefully this, as we go out from next week on this in-person um, open um, sessions, that we'll have more participation. Thank you. Mr. Eggleston? Thank you. Um, Ty, you and I have talked about a couple of specific things, but I'm sure everybody on the council has, like I have, gotten feedback from folks who have identified things that just don't square with the reality on the ground in certain areas or um, don't square with the rezonings and the, the changes that certain mm -hmm. corridors have seen um, that the city has encouraged or approved or uh, signed off on. So I, I understand that with as big a city as we are, there was no way this first draft was not going to need some adjustments. But I think for us to be looking at February or March adopting the map is ambitious. Um, I don't mind that so long as we don't vote on this thing before it's actually ready to be voted on. And I do think there's a desire, at least from some of the folks I've heard from, for us to be willing to take a more surgical and targeted approach at some of the adjustments than they feel like we have been willing to do so far. So I do appreciate all of the public engagement opportunities. I hope that as staff and council are hearing from folks that we are steering them towards those opportunities. I understand that planning staff isn't going to be able to meet with um, every single community group individually, but I hope that we are pointing them to the opportunities they have to provide that feedback. And I hope we're taking it seriously because uh, I don't want us to get to a point in February or March where there's still a lot of hand wringing about the changes that the community feels are needed or council feels are needed and those haven't been made and then uh, we end up where we were with the comp plan and delaying and, and having a divisive vote. So um, thanks for all the opportunities you've created, um, but I just kind of want to hedge the expectation that this would be in a position to be voted on in February in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Braxton? Yeah, I, um, so I, I think I'm just, just trying to think about how do we go through this um, and I'm, I'm taking all this information in. I understand the community is going through these work sessions and engagement sessions. I don't, I know we, this council, this body has been engaged and we get updates, but I don't know if we're necessarily familiar with the workshop and process. So could it be a good idea if we actually had a council workshop around um, policy map updates? That way we can engage ahead of time the constituency to, that follow us. That way we can do this in public view 
not only get feedback from the community at large, but also be able to compartmentalize these things that we all look at from our different purviews as a council. Is that an option, an opportunity for us to do as a full council? One night, one day. Well, we certainly could do it in tap. As but I think it would be a full council. This is a full, there's 13 people working on this. It's nothing is binding coming out of it. We're community members that are working on a policy um, place type map, and maybe we can better the outcomes and work through some of these things that, that we've identified here from a process standpoint. We are constituents as well as council members. That's okay. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Um, I will actually encourage that, and I think that that's a good thing. So. Um, I will work with Manager Jones and figure out when will be the right time to do it. The second draft comes out in January. We think that that second draft will address some of what um, Councilmember Eggleston brought up uh, in terms of some feedback you've been hearing from some of your constituents, whether they be associations or individuals. So should it be after that second draft or before? We'll, we'll work something out that could be a work session. It will be similar to this community conversation we've been having with the council. So you kind of get to see the flavor of the engagement that's going on. Okay. Is that, are we good? Any other questions on this? Some great suggestions. Um, so I appreciate everybody's comments and look forward to everybody participating in this process. So thank you. With that, we will go ahead and move on down to the chamber to begin our business meeting.
Good evening, everyone. If I can have your attention, please. I want to call the. I want to call this meeting to order for the November 8th business meeting of the Charlotte City Council. I am Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eisel, and I am presiding tonight as the mayor is taking care of a family health um, situation, which I think we all agree family comes first, so she's, I think they do, I think family comes first. But um, anyway, with, all, with that, we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order, and I'm going to start with introductions of the council. I'll start with myself, Julie Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem, and serving at large. And why don't we start on this end? Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Ed Driggs, District 7. Victoria Wallington, District 3. Tar Picari, District 6. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Mark Eggleston, District 1. Fine. Marcus Jones, City Manager. Greg Phipps, at large. Renee Johnson, District 4. Braxton Winston, at large. Dimple Ashmera, at large. And I Stephanie think Kelly, City Clerk. Thank you, and I think Mr. Newton will be joining us shortly, so thank you. Um, with that, we're going to begin our meeting with an invocation, which is an expression or an inspiration, and then we follow that with the Pledge of Allegiance. Our invocation by a council member is intended to solemnize our proceedings, and we celebrate the religious diversity of our community, including those without a religious faith. Tonight, Council Member Driggs will be giving our invocation. Mm. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. On Thursday this week, our country observes Veterans Day, an occasion for us to recognize and celebrate past members of our armed forces, both those who gave their lives for their country and those who served and survived. Let us be grateful for their dedication, their commitment, and the countless selfless acts they have performed so that we might continue to enjoy freedom. Let us thank them for their service to our nation, for their willingness to stand so that the rest of us might feel safe in the world. Let us be mindful of the sacrifices of their families and be grateful to them. Let us also be mindful of the fact that many veterans sacrificed their lives on the fields, on the seas, and in the air where the battles of the war were fought. We should remember those heroes today with great reverence and thanksgiving. On Thursday this week, may we all give thanks to those men and women, living and dead, who have served in our armed forces and may each of our veterans feel honored, not just on Veterans Day, but every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. And Mr. Graham is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would all stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Excuse me, we have other business. Okay, I'm going to have to say that if we can't follow the order of our meeting tonight, we're going to have to ask anybody who's disrupting the, order, the meeting to leave. Right now we do have some proclamations. No! We have some proclamations. We ha I acknowledge all of you being here. No, 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 excuse me, I'm asking you not to disrupt the meeting. Right now we have two proclamations that are also very important. The first one I will read um, is a day, the World Day of Remembrance for road traffic victims. And uh, the second one will be read by Mayor, uh, Council Member Johnson, and it's a proclamation recognizing November 17th as World Prem Prematurity Day. And um, I'd like to ask, is Ms. Sandra Pickens here today? Ms. Pickens, if you'd like to come down, we recognize you, Ms. Pickens, as your daughter, Briandra Newman, was tragically killed in a traffic fatality on January 5th, 2019. And Ms. Pickens is a member of the CMPD Traffic-Related Death Support Group. Whereas the World Day of Remembrance for road traffic victims is commemorated each year on the third Sunday of November, and whereas on October 26, 2005, the World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly as the appropriate acknowledgement for victims of road traffic crashes and their families. Whereas preventable injuries like road vehicle crashes, pedestrian, cyclist crashes are the leading cause of death for persons ages 1 to 44 in Mecklenburg County. 
And whereas reducing speeds, reducing distracting, distracted driving, increasing child passenger safety, increasing seat belt usage, decreasing impairment related crashes, and increasing investments in safer streets and systems all play an important part of creating the safest and most connected city in the country. And whereas Charlotte is committed to building a transportation network that encourages safe walking, biking, and driving behaviors, and whereas the World Day of Remembrance aims to remember all people killed and seriously injured on the roads, acknowledge the crucial work of the emergency services, and advocate for better support for road traffic victims and victim families, and promote evidence-based actions to prevent and eventually stop further road traffic deaths and injuries. Now, therefore, I, Vi Alexander Lyles, Mayor of Charlotte, do hereby proclaim November 21st, 2021, as World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims. And we, in Charlotte, commend its, obs obs its observance to all citizens. Ms. Pickens, if you would like to accept this and our condolences for the loss of your daughter. All right. Acknowledging our pain, our tears, and our broken hearts as we miss our loved ones and as we advocate for safe streets through Vision Zero and with the support of Charlotte Bakerberg Police Department support group. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pickens, and thank you for having the courage to speak on behalf of your daughter and for all victims of, of uh, road accidents and fatalities. I know it takes, it's hard to do and we appreciate you doing it. Thank you. And with that, Council Member Johnson, we'll go ahead with our proclamation for World Prematurity Day. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Is there anyone here from the March of Dime or that's going to accept this proclamation? Yes, I'm sorry. Pat Campbell, System Administrative Executive at the Women's and Children's Institute at Novant Health. Pat here? Pat will be accepting this proclamation. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Whereas families face serious health issues or health risk in March of Dimes fights for their health by supporting research, leading programs, and providing education and advocacy. And whereas March of Dimes is committed to mobilizing the nation by amplifying the voices of pregnant people and families. Whereas in North Carolina, March of Dimes has worked extensively to reduce preterm birth by improving access to care through closing the health insurance gap for individuals of reproductive age, eliminating maternity care deserts, expanding group prenatal care, increasing awareness of the impacts of implicit bias on maternal health care, and raising awareness of importance of optimal preconception health as a strategy to reduce preterm birth, infant mortality, and maternal mortality. And whereas March of Dimes will continue their work in the community to address the maternal and infant health crisis of prematurity, as well as social drivers of health, such as transportation and housing. And whereas the month of November is recognized as Prematurity Awareness Month, and November 17th is recognized as World Prematurity Day to raise awareness. Now, therefore, Vi Alexander Lyles, Mayor of Charlotte, do hereby proclaim November 17th, 2021, as World Prematurity Day in Charlotte and commend its observance to all citizens. Thank you. And I'd like to give this to Pat, uh, okay, on behalf of the Mayor and the City of Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we are going to move right into our policy item number 16, which is the proposed redistricting draft plan. 
And with that, I would like to, we've had a public hearing on this, so tonight we are asking for an action to consider and adopt the redistricting ad hoc committee's proposed redistricting plan, draft plan, which is the adoption of map B1. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Graham, our, our committee chair, to say a few words. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, um, members of council, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good evening. On July 8th, the mayor established the redistricting ad hoc committee. Um, she wanted that committee to be based on the data that we're receiving from the federal government. The mayor charged the committee to develop a redistricting recommendation based on the district criteria, legal principles, and public engagement. She also recommended that we bring back our decision to this meeting, November 8th, at our business meeting. We have to notify the Board of Elections by November 17th, the deadline for the revised district boundaries as required by law. The committee was established uh, and consisted of Council Members Ashmera, Dres, and Phipps, uh, who were members of the committee along with me. I would like to thank the staff, Rebecca, Lena, and the Attorney's Office for their help and their support. We also want to thank um, Parker Poe and Enfocus who were selected to provide legal service as help us guide through the process. On August 23rd, the committee met to discuss the mayor's charge and next steps. On August, September 7th, the committee met and developed criteria for redrawing off the district boundaries, review preliminary census data, and set future deadlines. Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, you should know that North Carolina continues to be one of the fastest growing states in the country. The city of Charlotte is one of 13 cities that grew by over 100,000 over the last 10 years. Uh, the charge of the committee literally was moving 30,000 residents from districts 2, 3, and 4 into district 1, 5, and 6. District 7 remained unchanged. We were bound by law to make sure that every district had plus or minus 125,000 citizens. On September 22nd, the committee met to review the final 2020 census data and draft and adopted four draft plans that were presented by the consultant based on the data. The, the drafts were entitled draft plans A, B, C, and D. Draft plans A, B, and C were voted out of the committee for consideration by the public and Phil Council. On top of October 5th, the committee met and convened a public listening session to receive input and answer questions during that session. On October 12th, the committee met to discuss the public session's comments, and draft B1 was presented as an alternative map based on additional feedback. Draft plan B1 was also for the other committee for consideration by the public and Phil Council. On October 18th, 2021, the Phil Council held a public hearing to receive comments and feedback on the four, the four proposed draft plans, A, B, B1, and, and C. On October 20th, the committee met to discuss the public hearing and feedback and voted unanimously to submit draft plan B1 as committee's recommendation for council's consideration. Therefore, today, the ad hoc committee um, presents to the council draft plan B1 for adoption, and I move for adoption. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mac McCarley, who's here, who is the attorney from Parker Poe. Thank you, Mac, who's... Uh, and the work on this plan to get us to here tonight. So thank you, Mac. Um, with that, I'd like to entertain a motion to consider and adopt the redistricting ad hoc committee's proposal, proposed redistricting draft plan and adopt map B1. So move. Second. Okay, any other comments? Uh, Ms. Johnson? Thank you. So there's been a lot of community conversation about the movement of precincts 42 and 82 from District 4 to District 1 in the recommended redistricting map that we are voting on tonight. And I do want to acknowledge the Hidden Valley residents and thank you for your passion. Um, and, and please know that this is not an easy decision for any of us. Um, and I've worked very hard for, for you, we all have in City Council. Um, many of the things that have been said are simply not true, and I feel the need to correct some of the misunderstandings. I believe that District 4 voters should have accurate information and that responsible leadership on my part requires that I speak to these issues. A leader should lead, not mislead. First, the city is redistricting because the law requires it. Every 10 years after the federal census, 
governments are required to redistrict if their district populations are out of compliance with one person, one vote principles. In our case, the census data showed that five out of our seven districts were out of compliance. Districts three and four were significantly over the allowed deviation of 5%, and districts one, five, and six were more than 5% under the ideal size. The, mo the point is that some precincts were going to have to move out of districts three and four to rebalance the population in our district system. The city hired a consultant to work with our ad hoc redistricting committee and the consultant drew the maps based on the criteria adopted by the committee. The most important criteria was that the districts needed to be the one person, one vote principle. The consultant has repeatedly said that the changes he proposed were primarily to balance the numbers. He has also said that he believed from the beginning that precincts 42 and 82 should be kept together since they are largely one neighborhood. Hidden Valley. Finally, he has explained to me that the only precincts in District 4 that could be moved without causing a problem with com compactness or contiguity were 205, 132, 26, 82, and 42. These are the precincts that border District 1 and 5, the two districts that population needs to be moved into. The numbers worked to move 205 into District 5 and precincts 42 and 82 together into the only district they bordered, District 1. I will state categorically that I did not tell the consultant to move precincts 42 and 82 out of District 4. And I didn't tell him to move precincts 26 or 205 either. I won the primary election in Precinct 26 by 17 percent and Precinct 205 by 44 percent of the vote. If I were trying to influence the consultant or the committee or the outcome of a vote, I certainly want, would not have wanted 205 or move with 44 percent. However, as a leader, I've sworn to make the best decisions for District 4 and for the city, and not myself. Hidden Valley was not targeted. The northern, northern precincts couldn't be moved because they don't border District 1 or 5. The most important thing to understand is that today, District 4 is at 43.9% black and will remain at 43% um, less than nine-tenths of one percent change. It's insignificant to the ability of the black voters in District 4 to continue to elect a representative of their choice. The recommended plan also increases the black vote by seven percent and the Democratic vote by five percent in District 1. This plan could actually strengthen our influence on the dais and in the city as black voters. I hope the citizens in District 4 will hear this information in the spirit which, is, which it is offered to base our opinions and actions on truth and facts and not rumor and not slander. For these reasons, I will be supporting the recommended map tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Uh, Mr. Winston. Uh, thank you citizens for coming out tonight. You know, um, the state of North Carolina is quite near ground zero um, of voter dis disenfranchisement through systemic policy initiatives. Legality is one of the main rationales. State law, according to state law, has been one of the main rationales for the process that the city of Charlotte City Council took on in this redistricting process. I wish we had taken a different rationale to our approach. I thought our community had agreed that we need to look at policy development through an equity lens coming out of the embracement of the Leading on Opportunity Task Force report. Tonight marks the abandonment of that equity lens. The committee, staff, 
consultants have all agreed they did not consider issues of equity in our approach. That is regrettable. This process also did not consider the recommendations and work of the Citizens Committee on Governance that made other suggestions uh, to our electoral processes. This would have been a time for us to do that. We are the corporate board of a multi-billion dollar organization. The excuse can't be we didn't have enough time or we had other things on our table. That was more important than this work that we have committed to our community to do. So I will be, we didn't just disservice the people of Hidden Valley, we did a disservice to the entirety of our constituency. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm an at-large member, um, so I am one of your representatives. Um, we have an opportunity to fix this. We can do it. Um, so I, I don't. I don't believe that. This, th I believe that this, this map will, will pass tonight. I will not be voting for it, but City Council has the opportunity to continue our work. We know we were thrown into a difficult situation, which is not an excuse, dealing with COVID, dealing with the delay of the election. Um, but I hope upon adoption of this map, City Council will leave this option open and we will send the work to the committee to keep working on it again yeah. and to take yeah. into all of those considerations uh, that we have expressed amongst ourselves, the community has expressed to us, and again, the Citizens Committee um, uh, has, has, has suggested us do um, in the work. So um, using the bar of one of the most notorious states the laws of one of those most notorious states of disenfranchising minorities is abhorrent. Um, I hope our work, uh, my suggestion, would be that we look to create a district map that utilizes as much of representation as possible. I would like to see something that breaks us down to 11 districts. Mm -hmm. I would like to see us have one at-large member so that the people can decide who the mayor pro tem is. And if you think about that, that those two citywide elections, mayor pro tem, as well as the mayor of Charlotte, you would actually, the people would actually be able to get a choice to check and balance the government that we exist in. With that, I'll be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Newton. Oh. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, pro Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I, I look forward to continuing the equity work as well, and I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I, I wanted to start by thanking everyone in the chamber here tonight. I think it is important that your voice be heard, and I appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, I also wanted to more specifically thank uh, two people in particular, that being Charlene Henderson and Cedric Dean. Uh, their passion, concern, and tireless dedication to the community is apparent and clear. And I wanted to note something that I think is really important that might get lost in this conversation, and that's through their efforts, the committee's recommended map, which is B1, will still be considered and weighed regardless of tonight's outcome. Uh, frankly, tonight's vote m might lend further certainty to the continued review and, assess uh, and assessment of map B1. And I know that Charlene and Cedric know what I'm talking about. Uh, having said that, uh, I am the representative of District 5, and as a result, uh, my primary responsibilities, obligations, 
and accountability lie with the residents of my district. Uh, map B1 is responsive to the request of the residents of District 5, uh, who specifically asked for precincts on Central Avenue and around the Eastland site, that being precincts 5 and 45, to be moved into District 5. This was communicated by my constituents uh, to the committee uh, and well, in that committee process and to me personally, uh, compelling me uh, to, uh, to support it at this time. Uh, much like all of my colleagues, tonight's decision is very difficult and very tough for me uh, and something that we collectively might be getting wrong. Um, but uh, that's why I'm glad to say that this is in the courts. It's in the federal court right now. Uh, that means that there will be independent oversight by uh, a neutral arbiter uh, regardless of what the outcome of tonight's decision is. And I just wanted to make that particular point. Uh, this doesn't end here tonight. So bear that in mind. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Ms. Hajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. So over past month, we have received questions around public hearing. I know we have had a public hearing about a month ago on this redistricting process. And I know I had asked that question at the committee level. So Mr. Baker, if you could respond to my question around public hearing and would speakers be allowed to speak again on this specific agenda item today? Pursuant to your rules of council procedures, once a public hearing has occurred, uh, we don't take uh, more uh, speakers for that particular uh, subject. So the public hearing having been adjourned at the last meeting, uh, this is now in front of the council for a decision. Thank you, Mr. Baker. So the answer is no, since we have already had a public hearing, we cannot have another public hearing, even if it's on a specific agenda item. Yes, pursuant to your, your uh, council rules of procedure, that's correct. So I know some of you have reached out to me about that. Uh, I know Dr. Penn, you have reached out, uh, as well as Cedric and so many others from Hidden Valley. Uh, about wanting to speak again. We have received your emails, your calls, your messages. And like Councilmember Newton said, this is not an easy decision for any one of us. Uh, this has been very difficult. We had to work under very condensed timeline. Um, and this doesn't end here, as Mr. Newton has said. Uh, but I appreciate you all continuing your advocacy and continuing your work. I look forward to putting in more work over next year and a half. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sajmira. Uh, Ms. Watlington? Sure. So first of all, I wanna say to the residents of District 3, um, as I mentioned last time, being that we were the largest district, we were going to have to move people into other districts. That was inevitable. I spent time talking with my community leaders, with some of my precinct chairs in affected district or in affected precincts, and it was clear no one wanted to move. However, they understood that when it comes to communities of interest, the precincts along our northern border were had more aligned with District Two than the precincts had that were. Um, that was next to District 6 and District 1. So I stand by that. I believe that that was the will of the community. The next thing I want to say is I see the signs. First of all, I love that you are here and that you all have come together to advocate for yourselves. I also stand with Hidden Valley. You are, I, and I don't believe there's anybody on this dais who is out to get Hidden Valley. I also support continued work in terms of redistricting. I've long, I've long said that as the district rep for the largest district that we need to be able to get closer to our people and with that need more district reps. So I absolutely look forward to and stand, stand, um, a stand next to my other resident or colleague, excuse me, that have said we want to continue this work. There are other sweeping infrastructure changes in terms of our government structure that we still need to address. The work is not done here. That said, we are required by law to have an updated district uh, map for this election. And so we are going to do that uh, tonight. Also, one thing that Council Member um, Johnson said that I think is extremely important is wherever you fall on the issue, you have got to be talking about the same facts. 
So I'd like to point out again that with this proposed B1, the new District 1 with Hidden Valley in it will be 36% black, 51% Democrats. And of those Democrats, 56% of us are black. I don't know how many of y'all play spades in here, but if you do, you've heard the saying, watch the board. We are Trump tight in District 4 and District 1. We are in a position in an open race to handpick our elected. Hidden Valley is not losing. You're winning. Respond. And with that, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, um, Ms. Watlington. I want to say something, and then I'm going to have our, um, our ad hoc chair wrap it up. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Phipps. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, <clears throat> it's, this is a difficult vote for me, in as much as I've been the recipient, the beneficiary of Hidden Valley support in election cycles for 2013, 15, and 17. I spent a lot of time in Hidden Valley, even when I'm not on city council. So to think that I would do anything to harm the valley is uh, not is, is difficult for me to, to, to really absorb. But I'm here to tell you tonight that I will continue to work in Hidden Valley. I mean, uh, I think you all have seen me around. So um, with this vote, even though it, it, it looks as if it might uh, uh, be uh, uh, approved tonight, that there is no, uh, you know, there is no, this is not an end to what uh, that you might ascribe uh, the outcome to be. But I thank you for your past support and uh, look forward to working even more in the Valley in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Mr. Bakari. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. First, I just want to say a thanks to um, the committee, uh, Malcolm Graham particularly, a lot of work, a lot of long journey there, and, and appreciate the outcome you came to. Two, while I hate to say it, everything you said is absolutely accurate at the end there, and that is the strategic answer. But um, beyond this, what I will say is, as a Republican sitting up here, I stand with my man Braxton Winston and what he just said about 11 district seats, one mayor pro tem, and one mayor run, that's going to be able to break this down to a more representative level. And as soon as we're done passing this, I hope all of you will activate and call and say that is a must, we must do, because that isn't a partisan thing, it's a representative thing. And I think that's something we could move on real quick if we got together on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Bakari. Did I miss anyone? Please, no applause. Before I go to Mr. Graham, um, I'm just going to say, as Mayor Pro Tem and an at-large representative, that when it comes to the topic of redistricting and precinct reassignment, it's, it's contentious. I know it is. And I'm aware that voters form an identity with their district, and it's sometimes an integral component of how you all see yourselves in, their na in your neighborhoods. There's a lot of passion and a lot of solidarity involved in this process, and I think it should be respected. I'm also aware that we're bound by law to make these changes and that there's types of choices that we often make that we're not going to be able to please everyone. But as an elected body with oversight over the 15th largest city in the United States and growing, I commit to you that we are doing our best to reach the outcomes that fulfill our legal requirement and benefit the highest proportion of Charlotteans. The energy on display tonight is important. And I call on everyone to maintain this level of voter engagement and neighborhood pride all year long. As a city, we're quickly approaching a new election cycle. And it would be amazing if we saw voter turnout in the primary, which we know the primary is important, but we rarely get out of single digits with voter turnout. So let's get, let's get to the polls. Get to the polls and show up. It would be amazing to have 40, 50, 60, 70 percent voter turnout in the primaries. The ballot box does belong to you. And it belongs to the people of Charlotte, and it's the most effective way to make your mark in this community. So let's turn tonight's passion, res passionate response into an ongoing series of community activism that continues at the polling places. Thank you for being involved in local government, and thank you for taking ownership in how your city is run. It's, it is the most critical thing you can do. 
voting at the local level impacts you more than at the state and federal level. So thank you. Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam um, Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, I'm speaking a second time as not the chairman, but the representatives from District 2. And I want to thank my, my constituents in District 2 who have worked with me for the last 18 months. We, too, are losing um, precincts to, to District 1. Um, some that many of you may be aware of. So I, I just make the point that this is a citywide process. We move 30,000 residents to get to the one man, one vote. Today, citizens of District 2 have the opportunity to elect an African American council member. Today, citizens of District 3 have the opportunity to elect an African American council member. Today, citizens in District 4 have the opportunity to elect a council member of African American descent. And Council Member Wallington has summed it up correctly. If you watch the board and connect the dots, District 1 can do the same. Our community is changing. Our community is growing. As I stated earlier, we're growing by 100,000 over the last 10 years. Only 13 other cities have done that. Uh, and so we are committed to equity. Uh, the council and the, the committee did exactly what the council instructed us to do, right? So we played within the framework in which we were given. Uh, and as I told the council earlier, if you really want to have a, council, a conversation about governance, let's talk about consolidation. That's the ultimate governance structure that this community really needs. I support the map. I support my council district too. I look forward to all the new citizens that will be coming to District 2 after this vote. Thank you, Mr. Graham. And with that, we have a motion and a second. So because we're all in attendance tonight, we don't have to follow the virtual rules by having individual votes. So I'm going to ask for a hand raise of all of those in favor of the motion to consider and adopt the redistricting ad hoc committee's proposed redistricting draft plan, map B1. All in favor? Okay. Okay. And all opposed? Okay, that's 10 in, in favor and one opposed, so the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we're, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. And that is our consent agenda items. We'll give everyone a moment to clear out if you're not staying for the rest of the meeting. Okay, thank you. We're going to go ahead and go on um, with our meeting. The next agenda item is item number seven. Uh, I would like to ask for a motion to accept con uh, consent agenda items 39 through 79 um, for passage with the exception of 21, 59, and 68. And then I'm asking for a separate vote on items number 40 and 41. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor of um, <laughs> accepting items 39 through 79 with the exceptions of 59, 21, 59, 68, at, which have been pulled by staff, and then we'll have a separate vote on 40 and 41. Mayor Pro Tem, just to clarify, 21's a business item, so that'll be separate as well. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, that one's pulled from the agenda. Thanks. So. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're right. Sorry about that. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Or, sorry. Yes, no. Mr. Eggleston, do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And with that, we will have a separate vote on item number 40, which is to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute a unit price contract with ANA Services Group for security guard services for an initial term of one year and authorize the city manager to renew the contract for up to two one-year terms with possible price adjustments and to amend the contract consistent with the purpose of which the contract was approved. May I have a motion? So moved. A second? Second. second. <laughs> All in favor. I'm oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Bakari, you have a comment. Yes, Mr. Bakari, uh, tell us. Oh what do you think, Mr. Bakari? <laughs> Not the first time today. Mr. Drake, what do you think? We weren't that much different. Speak up, Ed. Two sides of the same coin. No, go ahead, Mr. Bakari. <laughs> um, I, I just got to point out the irony here that CMPD does not think does, does not think their own officers are worth the cost to patrol portions of our neighborhood. When I talk to um, staff about this today, <laughs> that is the um, rationale why we are hiring outside consultants to provide patrol services for an organization that employs professional patrolmen. Um, this is, uh, it, it, it just, it, 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 honestly, I'm at a loss for words. Um, if we need to secure our premises, I think that is something that uh, we should figure out utilizing the professionals that we do have. I'm not asked a question, so I just go ahead and say I'll vote no. Okay, thank you, Mr. Winston. Um, okay, that was, any other comments? Okay, with that, may I have a vote? All in yes. favor of authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute a unit. Uh, all in favor of actions A and B. Right. Yes. Okay. In opposition? Okay, so that ten, passes 10 to 1. I'm sorry, I'm getting, getting used to going back to where we were two years ago with our procedure. I apologize about the bumps. Okay. The next item is item number 41. U.S. Department of Justice Fiscal Year 2021 Edwin Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant. The action is A, authorize the city manager to accept an Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant in the amount of $623,432 from the U.S. Department of Justice. And and B, adopt a resolution approving a memorandum of understanding with Mecklenburg County as a law enforcement partner. May I have a motion to ad adopt A and B? So moved. Second. Do I have a second? I'll second. I think Ms. Penn seconded. <laughs> All in favor of items A and B? Raise your hand. Opposition? All right, that passes 10 to 1. Okay, that is it for our consent agenda items. Okay, then we move along to our public hearings. We're now going to open the public hearings on the, the first one is um, for the Parkside Crossing Area Voluntary Annexation. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? No, ma'am. Okay, may I have Motion a motion? close the public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor of closing the public hearing on Parkside Crossing and, oh, Mr. Phipps. Yeah, I, had a, I had a comment. So this, this particular um, item, voluntary ex, uh, annexation, is for 550 units plus another 150 units equals 700 units, right? Total residential units. So I think this is an example of what we were talking about in our redistricting process where you have areas in the ETJ coming into the city and uh, increasing our numbers that way, plus we have organic increases in population, which I hope uh, our uh, population numbers for districts that have these ETJ areas, districts three, two, and four, would have a reduced, I know it was stated that we needed to have 125,000 population, so I would hope that those numbers would be a little less in those districts to be able to absorb the growth that we're having in these voluntary annexation uh, areas. Is that the case? 
whoever. Mr. Chair, Chair of the Ad Hoc Committee, or Mr. Baker, is that uh, how we're going to be more or less uh, populating those three di districts that have ETJs adjacent to their boundaries? Well, they, well, when they do get annexed in, they go into that district, and I think that's going to be put in, in the documentation. So that's how, that's how your growth actually occurs in between the, uh, uh, the redistricting is, is when either within your, your districts or uh, as folks ask for uh, to be to be annexed, and that that's where your growth is going to come. Yeah, but this one that we're working on, to, this one right here, is becomes effective upon our vote in favor, right? Yes. So, I thought that was a procedure that we would we wouldn't have one hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars population for those three districts in anticipation of the growth in the ETJ areas, or else we would be still in the same position. We are in now. Is that is that the case? Mayor Pro Tem, can I just... Uh, Mr. Drake? The way this was done, right, we looked at growth rates, we took into account factors such as potential growth in the districts, and we, uh, we tried to balance the numbers in such a way that the high growth districts, the one with the most potential for population growth, were targeted below the average right. and, and the others above. That included the potential for annexation. Now, you know, in the old days when there was involuntary annexation, we actually had new districting process whenever annexation resulted in the numbers getting out of kilter. In the environment we're in today, if you think back, Greg, and we, you and I go back a long time, uh, it's unlikely that we will, ba we will bang into that based solely on the voluntary annexations. So I think we have provision for the annexations that will occur within the numbers uh, that we are adopting tonight. So, so am I correct in saying that districts three, two, and four, will they be at the 125,000 population now, or will those three districts have a slightly reduced population other than the, uh, what we, the so average that we've The seen? materials that we got uh, laid out very clearly what the, the population will be under the, the plan. And those, those districts, my recollection is those districts are in fact below because they're the ones identified as the high growth districts. Thank you. Uh, that, is, that is correct. I've got the numbers here and, okay. and that is correct. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. So let me repeat the motion because I didn't include B. Um, the action is to conduct a public hearing for the Parkside Crossing Area Voluntary Annexation and adopt an annexation ordinance with an effective date of November 8th, 2021 to extend the corporate limits to include <clears throat> this property and assign it to the adjacent city district, city council district three. We have a motion to close the public hearing and adopt the annexation ordinance. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. We are now going to hear um, item number 12, a public hearing on a resolution to close a portion of Kinghurst Drive. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers? Oh, Motion um, to close the public hearing. Second. I have to just read the full action. Uh, conduct a public hearing to close a portion of Kinghurst Drive and adopt a resolution and close a portion of Kinghurst Drive. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Um, number 13 is uh, open a public hearing on a resolution to close Newell Farm Road. That's to, the action is to conduct a public hearing to close Newell Farm Road and adopt a resolution and close Newell Farm Road. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers signed up? No, ma'am. Motion ma to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. <laughs> Madam Mayor, for time, if I could just, just for clarity's sake, I just want to check in with the clerk. I'm hearing a, a motion to motion close. Motion to the close and adopt a resolution. As well. Okay. We're a little rusty back at the back. I, I completely <laughs> with understand. All of us motion in to person. close the public hearing and adopt a resolution. Again. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any yeah. opposed? Thank you. We have you. adopted. We have adopted. We have. 14 is a resolution, um, public hearing on a resolution to close the Greer Avenue unopened right-of-way. The action is to conduct a public hearing to close the Greer Avenue unopened right-of-way and adopt a, and B, adopt a resolution and close the Greer Avenue unopened right-of-way. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? No, ma'am. Motion to close the public hearing and adopt a resolution. Second. All in favor? Oh, oh Ms. Esmira. Yes. So 
on this item, we did receive an email from a constituent regarding um, regarding the notice, public notice. So, um, constituent sent us an email saying that um, the notice of the public hearing for the right of way closure should be posted in two prominent places along the street, and they sent us the pictures and that. And it says that didn't happen. We only received notice about the closure from today's city council agenda. So, Mr. Attorney, if you could speak to that. I know that, um, um, did you get that email as well? I didn't get the email, but I am familiar with the situation. Uh, okay. I did ask um, my attorney to ask the staff, and she did get an answer as to whether or not there is a staff person that could, if called, to testify that they actually put the sign up. My understanding is that, that there is a staff person who did put the signs up, and I trust someone from the staff here is hopefully not going to contradict me. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, members of council. My name is Casey Mashburn, and I'm CDOT right away section manager. Uh, so on this item, we did receive confirmation from our field staff that the signs were installed on 927 as a uh, obligated by uh, North Carolina general statutes. And so we have made that confirmation. I'm not sure what happened in between us installing those signs and today, um, but we have clarified that they were installed in accorded and in accordance as such. Guys, so what happens if the sign um, goes missing um, after it's installed? Uh, yes, ma'am. So in the future, we will always uh, double check all of these issues. This is uh, the first issue that we have had in this uh, such instance. And so normally we do not have issues such as this. Signs are installed and taken down as appropriate once council has passed the motion uh, or a resolution to close. And so in the future, we will have confirmation of uh, signs being installed. Got it. So what I hear is the process improvement to check that sign stays on till it's adopted. That is correct. And so as part of the general statutes, we are obligated to install those signs. There is no requirement for us to check those. However, we will take that procedure in the future uh, to ensure this does not occur. Appreciate it. Uh, I, this was only brought to our attention earlier today from a constituent, so I appreciate you addressing that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second to uh, close the public hearing and adopt the resolution. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that concludes our public hearings. That, and that brings us to our policy items, and I'll go to turn it over to Mr. Manager for the city manager's report. So thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. The only item that I have that's uh, before you at the dais is the 30 day, city manager's 30 day update. And we have the zoning meeting on the 15th. And then on November 22nd, the next business meeting, we'll give you a COVID-19 update. A lot has happened in terms of uh, where we've been with uh, some of our pr programs related to COVID and some information that's coming from the federal government. Also, a report on the mayor's racial equity initiative. We'll also have the proposed 2022 city council meeting schedule. And then as we discussed um, earlier today in 267 at the December 6th strategy meeting, we'll have an update for the, the UDO ordinance as well as a bit of discussion to follow up from what occurred today as it related to the policy map. And we'll also make sure that we incorporate a discussion that deals with some of the transportation state issues, state road issues that I will amend this and add that to it as well as that committee report out. So that is my 30 day minute. Okay, thank you. Ms. Johnson? Yes. If we could get an update on the 22nd on the status of the water, the utility oh, sure. bills for the sure. residents, please. Sure. I think we can um, put, roll that under the COVID-19 yeah. update too. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mr. Vicari? If there's any opportunity to get pre-reading information about the mayor's racial equity initiative before that, I think that would be nice. I think a lot of us were excited when we heard about it uh, for the first time at that event. So if we could get a little info on that, perhaps, to come into that dialogue with, um, with an understanding of what's going on there, that would be helpful. Will do. Okay, thank you. 
The next item then, we move on to our business items. Uh, item number 17 is the Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing Rental Subsidy Program. And the action is to approve the guidelines for a citywide naturally occurring affordable housing, otherwise known as NOAA, rental subsidy program to expand opportunities for low-income households to live in high-quality NOAA developments through the creation of new long-term rental subsidies. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any comments? Mr. Phipps? I have a question. Um, has the city secured a commitment from the county to participate in the rental subsidy program? Uh, Ms. Weidman, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Pamela Weidman. Mr. Phipps, I'm sorry, I was transitioning in. If you could repeat your question, please. Has the city secured a commitment from the county to participate in the rental subsidy program? Yes, sir. That was on October 5th that, that the county approved the program. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Uh, Mr. Driggs? So, Mayor, uh, I believe this is the program involving tax taxes and subsidies. And uh, I've expressed some misgivings about the fact that we don't necessarily have an exact match between uh, the tax relief and the subsidy. So to that extent, it's not a perfect structure in my mind. I will support it because I think the value is there. So I have a level of comfort based on the transactions we've seen that, that this is an opportunity for us. And I won't let my kind of conceptual problem stop me, but I'm going to be looking at these deals as they come along to make sure on a case-to-case -case basis that what we're giving up in tax proceeds is in proportion to the amount of subsidy that's being provided for affordable housing, because it's just a feature of this thing that those are not necessarily identical. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Ms. Hajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> so we know when we talk about affordable housing, the most need is in zero to 30% AMI. And this is a solution, a potential solution that really addresses the issue without us pouring in so much money into developing uh, uh, developing units at 30% AMI or below. We know that if we want to develop or preserve 30% AMI or below, it's going to take more amount of money from our housing trust bucket. So this solution is really creative, and I appreciate uh, the private sector coming forward, especially nonprofit sector as well, coming forward and addressing the affordable housing crisis, especially preserving, so that way we are not displacing residents that are living in this unit. So uh, I'm actually very grateful for um, this kind of creative solution. And Ms. Weidman, to you and your team, uh, we appreciate your work on this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and Ms. Weidman, I'll add to that too, that I, I have to say what's so exciting about this, aside from subsidies coming from the private sector, which is awesome, it's the, this, this program, the structure of this program, gives the private sector the ability to jump on those NOAAs when they come available, because as we know, when government tries to do it, it has to be announced, there's a process, and it's gone by then. So I think it allows us to be more nimble um, and help get the private sector's help to secure those NOAAs before they disappear to the to the free market. So with that, um, do I have a motion? To there to go. Oh, all right. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks for your work on that, Ms. Wyden. Number 18 is a municipal agreement for new traffic signal. And the action item is to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute a mun municipal agreement with the North Carolina Department of Transportation in the amount of $400,000 and B, adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $950,000 for the installation of a traffic signal at Mount Holly Road and Rhine Road and Sonoma Valley Drive in the General Capital Projects Fund. Move to approve A and B. May I have a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. That passes uh, unanimously. Number 19 is the Metropolitan Planning Program Grant Municipal Agreement. And the item is, the action is A, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute a municipal agreement with the North Carolina Department of Transportation to support transit planning activities for the Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Organization 
and B, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager or his designee to execute interlocal agreements with Iredell County, Iredell County Area Transportation System and Union County Transportation to support transit planning activities for the Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Organization. May I have a motion to adopt? Move to approve A and B. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The next item is to appropriate funds for the West Boulevard Extension Project. The action is to adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $219,620 from Crescent Communities to reimburse the city for the purchase of mitigation credits for the West Boulevard Extension Project in the General Capital Projects Fund. May I have a motion to adopt? So moved. moved. Any, any comments? Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? Great. Um, okay, that, mm -hmm. we move on now to our nominations. Tonight, the city council. 21. 21. Oh, 21 has been pulled by staff. Oh, okay. So that's for, I think that's gonna come back to us later still. All right, tonight city council will consider nominations to various boards and commissions. The council members submitted their nominations earlier to the clerk via email. Names of nominees will not be read at the dais. Tomorrow the clerk will email city council for the names of applicants that received names of applicants that received at least two nominations. These candidates will be considered for appointment at the next business meeting. Any applicant receiving six or more nominations can be considered for appointment tonight upon a motion, second, and majority vote of the council. The names of all non nominees will be recorded in the official minutes of the meeting, and the clerk will now proceed with announcing the results of the nominations. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Pro Tem and council, there are numerous uh, boards that received um, more than six or six or more nominations so if you'll allow me to read through them and then uh, proceed with a motion, a second, and a vote if you're so inclined. For the Arts and Science Council Advisory Committee, uh, that will be delayed and we'll come back to you at a future meeting. For the Bicycle Advisory Committee, there were five appointments requested. Four persons received 11 nominations. Those are James Lee, the in, an incumbent, Elizabeth Pratt, an incumbent, Eon Shell, an incumbent, and Angela Stanovich, an incumbent. For the Business Advisory Committee, one appointment um, recommended by the Hispanic Contractors Association, there are no recommendations. For the Charlotte International Cabinet, Akofa Dosu received 11 nominations. For the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Access Corporation, Nicole Arnold received 11 nominations. For the Charlotte Tree Advisory Committee, Sarah Gagney received, an incumbent received 11 nominations, as did Scott Roberts, also an incumbent, 11 nominations. For the Citizens Transit Advisory Group, one appointment for a partial term. Michael Young received six nominations. For the Community Relations Committee, we will bring back those nominations uh, to you at the next meeting, as no one received more than six. The, for the Domestic Violence Advisory Board, Christine Hart, an incumbent, received 11 nominations. There were no applications for a resident owner for the Historic District Commission. For the Housing Appeals Board, Bradley Caldwell, Bradley E. Caldwell received six nominations. For in Livian, the one appointment for an assisted housing resident category representative, Irvin Robinson received 11 nominations. For the two appointments for three-year terms, Fatina Lorick re received 11 nominations, as did the incumbent Ray McKinnon. For the passenger vehicle for hire, there were no applications for a representative of the hospitality tourism industry. 
for the Privatization Competition Advisory Committee, Barbara Coppola received seven nominations. For the Stormwater Advisory Committee, Ilanka Alward received, received 10 nominations. And for the Zoning Board of Adjustment, we will bring those back to you at the next meeting as no one received six or more nominations. Motion to appoint all nominees receiving six or more nominations. Second. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. And with that, that concludes our business meeting this evening. Motion to close. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Wow. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to have to start council topics again soon. <laughs>